Glad to be here. On uh, today is my actually today is the day of my sixth anniversary uh, in video. So very happy to be talking about this stuff uh, today to to you all, um, both uh, live and on the recording. Um, so as uh, Chris said, my name is uh, Michael Lang. I'm one of the solutions architects uh, here in uh, the Southeast Asia ANZ region. Um, and I'm going to take you through the first part of this presentation. Um, we've got the two parts and two speakers and my colleague uh, Gabriel will uh, follow on with um, arguably some of the, the more interesting stuff. But to set the context here, um, the goal is really to uh, share the some of the updates on the full stack uh, solution that NVIDIA have. And um, for not for those of you not aware of it, we actually have more people working on software nowadays than we do on hardware. Uh, but our hardware portfolio has also expanded quite considerably with the acquisition of uh, Mellanox uh, last year. So there's some interesting things we're doing at the, um, I'm going to say the network compute layer or the super smart NIC layer as well, which is doing some interesting things in the compute space. Um, I'll touch on the hardware piece. Uh, and Gabriel will go a bit more into depth in many of the rather exciting bits and pieces of software. And in fact, as uh, Chris mentioned, uh, overnight there were some announcements at ISC and um, as they're not embargoed, uh, we can now talk about them. So this is the first uh, public presentation that we're making on those. Just to set some context here, um, different things fit into different parts of the solution sets that we see with our customers. Obviously, um, you know, high performance compute is the centricity of what we're talking about today, but there's different aspects of that and how it works. So, you know, we talk about um, the large scale set piece, we talk about uh, individual um, edge cases, the edge being probably more relevant to the AI uh, workspace than anything else. Um, how we uh, try and appliance that or make it as easy to consume as possible. And again, that's a mix of hardware and software software stuff and even some of the things we do um, to accelerate the entire stack um, you know, network and storage as well as that because uh, there's always a bottleneck somewhere uh, in, in something so we're always trying to uh, chase those and, uh, and remove them. On that note, um, and again, over, overnight, we've had some announcements in this space. We've done rather well in this space of recent times. So we're very, very proud to have, um, as of the most recent updates, uh, eight of the top 10 uh, supercomputers in the world. Um, and we've got about 68% of the uh, top 500 uh, list. Um, and uh, there's about 20% uh, more InfiniBand systems uh, for those of you who are feeling free to get geeky on your networking stuff uh, than it was previously uh, IC20. So things are changing in that space. Um, we are incredibly proud uh, to have such a high representation in the uh, green 500 as well. Um, obviously, uh, compute is taking off at a very, very rapid space uh, in both the cloud and on-prem. Um, and, you know, greening of this is something that we're um, really, really proud to be part of. And in fact, I'll touch on some of that a, a bit later on specifically. And of course, uh, there's the um, uh, HPL uh, AI aspect of this as well. So there's some uh, specific things we've done uh, with that new benchmark and how that's uh, gaining momentum in uh, supercomputer centers. And eight of the top 10 uh, computers uh, that uh, have been running that um, are powered by uh, our stuff as well. So speaking of the stuff that makes things go so fast um obviously you you're usually aware that uh, we've uh, announced as of last year our um ampere architecture or ampere gpu architecture and this is novel in a couple of ways it does a few bits and pieces there's things we've introduced as a volta and we've expanded those uh, things considerably so we have um the uh the tensor cores or also known as the ai cores to many people um but they don't just do ai anymore there's some um, some uh, hpc uh, functionality specifically that they can accelerate as well um, so they're up to their third generation now. Uh, second generation was in the Turing, first generation was in Volta. And we've also got some of our uh, ray tracing cores, they're up to second generation. Now, some people will think they're not as relevant to um, uh, the scientific community, but in terms of simulation, that is actually uh, expanding a lot of people doing simulation workloads. And we've got some um, software called Omniverse, which is assisting people uh, developing uh, simulation capabilities there. Uh, we've also got our uh, custom NVLink, uh, technology and NV switch technology. Um, I talked about bottlenecks before. NV Link is a key thing to try and eliminate that. So the Ampere GPU support PCIe 4, which is nice and fast and, and fantastic. Um, the third gen NV Link and NV switch technology is in fact 10 times faster than that. So this allows for very, very high speed interconnect of the GPUs and the GPU memory. So when you've got your excessively large models and, and data sets that you work with, and bless you for that, um, things can travel faster back and forth between those in interconnected um, GPUs and uh, also some nodes. 
We've also introduced, as of the Ampere generation, uh, sparsity capabilities. So sparsity, uh, as uh, I was explaining to one of my kids the other day, is uh, imagine if you're playing a game of Jenga, you know, and there's all these holes and gaps. Um, when we come to the computational aspect, it's really uh, ignoring those uh, and uh, accelerating the computational capabilities by, well, I suppose, in effect, not calculating the empty cells in Excel. That's the, the rough equivalency there. And so uh, this has been taken mostly in the AI space, um, but that code is there to be uh, leveraged um, for other bits and pieces as well. So all in all, it's a, a combination of a variety of things that, that tend to uh, accelerate some of these bits and pieces. And I'll touch on the last one there uh, in a separate slide because it has implications for a quas and, and um, micro capabilities and bursting as well. Overnight, uh, we announced um, the A100 PCIe version of our uh, Ampere A100 GPU. It has been available in the NVLink version at 80 gig, but now uh, it will be shipping in PCIe versions as well. We've seen a massive demand uh, for uh, workloads uh, across the spectrum, no matter what the form factor uh, people like to consume it in. Um, but that 80 gig is something that, it, um, well, I personally thought we never see people uh, using that much memory, but they are. So this is the explosion of, um, of models, uh, the explosion of complexity of data sets and, and size in general is really pushing that boundary. Um, and NVLink assists with that as well. Now, you know, obviously um, people ask questions around how fast this is. And, uh, you know, I guess this is a vendor slide and your mileage may vary. Uh, for those of you who look at this slide afterwards, you'll see that there's actually, uh, this is a summation of multiple benchmarks. So taking the P100, uh, as a, uh, a standard, as, as a, a factor of one, across Amber, Chroma, Gromax, uh, and a few other uh, NAMD and PyTorch different um, benchmarks, uh, the average speed up on the A100 compared to uh, the P100 is over 11 times. And as you can see, it's still more than double uh, the V100 uh, capabilities as well. Some of this is also to do with some of the code bits and pieces we're doing as well, and, and um, Gabriel will touch on that. But obviously the hardware level alone has massive capabilities for performance. Um, I'll touch on the MIG stuff as well, because that has implications for how you structure uh, your workloads and what you can do there. Obviously, uh, this is not just for um, uh, HPC, but AI as well, and we're seeing AI workloads grow in traditional uh, HPC centers of excellence. And this is actually um, across a variety of different uh, use cases. As, as much variety as there is in the HPC code base, there is also in the uh, AI code base as well, uh, in the um, way the data is used and, and different networks and different frameworks as well. So certainly the performance here, uh, the minimum one we see obviously is a 2.5 speed up, um, but uh, that gets up to 20 in some cases. So it's really quite remarkable. And this has left some of our customers with a, hey, I've got a really super fast chip. What happens if I want to break up these workloads for different people doing different things? So this is where this, this technology that I made a brief reference to before called multi-instance GPU or MIG. We've had the ability to slice up our GPUs for a very long time uh, in virtualization. Uh, and that's actually one of the specialties that, that I, I um, focus on. Um, but that does require a degree of complexity and orchestration um, having hypervisors, Red Hat, vSphere, variety of others as well, Linux. So what the MIG capability is, is um, at a base code level to chop up the GPU at the hardware level. So it's uh, effectively segmentation and isolation uh, of both memory and cores across different workloads. And you can see here, there's a, a combination of inferencing and TensorFlow and you know, Amber, and a few others there as well. Um, the maximum we can do on a v, at an A100 uh, chip is up to seven slices. It's a bit of maths as to why that is the case. But we can do um, asymmetrically sized um, slices, which really means that if we need to uh, right size a workload for um, something that a, a researcher is doing, we can have multiple um, bits and pieces carved out for their work. Some might be in production, some might be in test. And we really wanna make sure that by a cause, uh, we've got, you know, isolation of capability so that you don't get, um, you know, uh, interference from, from other workloads. Hypervisors do a decent job of that, um, but they do introduce some level of complexity. So being able to do this at the base hardware layer is, is really quite a, a game changer for, uh, for many of our customers. And uh, it's been adopted quite a lot, actually, which is, which is really, really good. Um, the opposite of this, of course, is scaling up and scaling out. 
And we often get asked the question, uh, you know, how do we do this or how do we cater for that? Or can we do be in a best of breed for, for scaling out a large workload? And um, we do this as well. So um, yes, we have the A100 GPU. It's available in a variety of form factors. Um, up until uh, yesterday, this slide was accurate. I haven't updated this morning because the PCA here is listed as 40 gig only. That's now changed. Um, and, um, you know, there's, again, a variety of form factors from a variety of vendors you can whack those into. Um, and then we have what we refer to as our HGX options. The HGX options are a four-way or an eight-way board, which scales up and scales out considerably. And those boards have uh, NVLink or uh, uh, built in uh, natively to the motherboards. So when you've got uh, multi uh, GPU capable uh, workloads, you can uh, get the maximum throughput and inter GPU connectivity and scalability that you need on your system. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, in the AI space, this is quite critical because, uh, you know, memory makes a difference as to how you load up your model. And if you have to split up your data sets, it can actually change the outcome of things. So a few different options are available, both from us and a variety of vendors um, with uh, interconnectivity. And what's not mentioned here uh, is, as I mentioned before, the uh, networking uh, capabilities, um, that we maximize those for uh, node to node, so server to server connectivity as well. Um, when you scale out beyond a single node, trying to get that uh, throughput is, is really quite key. Needless to say, uh, I focused on the A100. Uh, we do have a variety of different GPUs. Um, just as a, as a reference point here, on the left, we've got the A100 and its baby brother, the A30, which I'll touch on just a second. But there are a variety of other cards as well. So uh, for those of you doing AI workloads uh, and you want to do inferencing at the edge, the T4, which is roughly the size of a mobile phone, um, does inferencing absolutely fantastically and is very widely deployed. We've got um, University of Wollongong uh, using those for uh, edge inference for uh, our use cases and, and a variety of other commercial customers as well. And then the other cards tend to be used for a mix of compute and graphical workloads. So um, that may be relevant here. We've got a few of our um, higher education university customers offering remote scientific workstations um, on variety of cards depending on what you need to do so that way no matter where you are your uh, actual workload is running in the data center co-located with all the data and all the high-end compute you can get all the visualization or uh, compute capabilities need remotely on macbook productivity laptop ipad uh, wherever you need to be and sadly given the state of uh, the world over the past year and a half uh, those remote uh, solutions have become uh, more and more required unfortunately so that's something that is, uh, is being picked up a fair bit as well and again this is one of the areas that, that I tend to focus on so I did mention that A30 is a baby brother to the uh, A100 um, and uh, that's a, a 24 gig card uh, with a few a fewer cores. Um, it has the same uh, capabilities, except uh, it does uh, a bit less in terms of the number of big instances. So you can only get up to four, whereas the A100 could run up to seven of those. We do get asked a question around performance. So um, here's the obligatory uh, performance uh, slides. Um, and uh, as you can see, it still outperforms uh, the V100 quite considerably, um, but nowhere near as much as uh, its um, uh, big sibling, the, the A100. So that's uh, again, available in a variety of different form factors. So um, usually that would be uh, the end of uh, what we focus on and, and how we talk about bits and pieces, software aside, which I'm not allowed to steal Gabriel's thunder, but he's, he knows it very, very well. Um, but uh, it, as uh, Steve Jobs always used to say, you know, one more thing, right? And we've actually had a significant architectural change uh, in what we're doing over the, uh, the past uh, several months. There was an announcement made at our last uh, GDC uh, conference uh, that was held virtually. Um, and that was the announcement of a brand new architecture from us, which we call Grace. Now, Grace is a bit of a change, not in terms of the nature of the GPU, which obviously we go through in multiple generational changes. It's the nature of what it coexists with, which is ARM. So we've obviously been supporting ARM for uh, publicly for quite a period of time. In fact, I believe the last benchmark we had um, was um, about 26 times faster on, on ARM chips. Um, but this is the first foray that we've had formally into uh, these uh, combined architectures. So Grace is designed uh, for scale out uh, work for HPC. We often get asked the question of why, uh, and you know, what, why, why step away from you know, what you're uh, or 
already working with on x86 architecture combined with GPUs? And the answer is architecture, which is really this. So the traditional x86 architecture has some real challenges uh, in terms of bottlenecks with uh, memory. And whilst we've done a great job of expanding those and the architecture itself is actually quite good, the question is, can we go further? And as you can see in the massively parallel architecture of ARM, we've got the capability to really expand out um, the speed at which data transfers back and forth. And obviously with um, uh, you know, compute, uh, memory capabilities are a really, really, really big thing. So this is uh, the interconnectivity between the CPU and the GPU and um, the uh, memory space. Um, the architecture is considerably different. The first uh, formal announcement of deployment of this uh, is the aptly named uh, European supercomputer ALPS, um, which is planned for 2023 off the top of my head um, for deployment. Uh, and the plan for that is 20 exaflops of AI compute. Uh, so we're doing that in conjunction with Hewlett Packard. Obviously the customer is the Swiss National uh, Computing Center, which is why I, I love the, the Alps thing there. Um, so we have a roadmap uh, for our uh, Grace architecture and how it's being deployed, but ARM is a significant thing uh, for us going forward. Now, I don't see any questions in the chat window, so I might pass uh, directly to Gabriel at this point for him to continue the uh, software aspect of uh, the presentation. Uh, I will stop sharing and Gabriel, let you pick that up. Okay, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, let me switch to my screen now. Okay, so uh, I think you're able to, to see my slides. So let's get started. So Michael did an introduction of the work that we are doing uh, on the hardware part. And actually I stole one of uh, Michael's slides from the beginning because I want to, uh, to continue the, the discussion on this uh, NVIDIA full stack uh, computing platform. Michael talked mostly about the, the bottom layers, the, the, GP, uh, the, the GPU infrastructure. He mentioned briefly about the, the smart NICs and some of the, the, uh, the servers that we have either from us or from the, uh, the OEMs where we integrate these chips. But as you can see here, there's actually a lot more coming from NVIDIA and that's in the software space. And that's actually taking more of this, uh, this diagram. Uh, with the uh, ISC conference uh, that has just started yesterday uh, in uh, in Germany, and I really uh, miss uh, going back to, to Germany. Uh, I would have probably met some of you there in um, in Frankfurt at the uh, exhibition center, uh, if not of uh, COVID and the the whole pandemic uh, craziness. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm happy that. Uh, I can give you an overview of the uh, latest announcements hot of the, the press. Uh, we just announced some of the, the things uh, yesterday. Uh, so it's really, really uh, brand new stuff. So I'm going to start from the, from the bottom with a couple of announcements that we did around uh, CUDA and uh, CUDA X libraries. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the um, AI and HPC uh, libraries and SDKs. And then uh, we're going to leave a, a little bit of uh, time for, uh, for Q&A at the, the end. And once again, just to, to give you an, uh, an idea of the breadth of the, the software development that NVIDIA is doing, we now have more than 150 SDKs. So obviously, I'm not going to be able to, to touch on uh, all of them. Uh, we did have uh, updates in between ISC and our GPU technology conference. Uh, back in April, uh, we had the updates that almost touch on all the, the SDKs that we currently have, and we launched some new ones. So there's, uh, there's really a lot of uh, things that are coming from NVIDIA on the software side. So with that, uh, let, uh, let's get started. And as I said, I'm going to start from the bottom of that diagram. And uh, the, the CUDA programming language uh, still remains, and it's been for the past uh, 13 years now, the foundation for programming the, the GPUs. We are now at the version 11.4. Uh, uh, 11 so we announced this yesterday at um, ISC, and it's going to be available for download starting today. Uh, there are 
a couple of uh, major uh, features that we introduced with the uh, with the version 11.4. Uh, you have them listed there. I'm not going to go through to all of them. If you're really uh, interested in all the uh, all the details, I've put the the bottom of the the slide the the link to to our release notes, where, which has a comprehensive overview of the um, of the the new features included in the in the CUDA 11.4, but just to give you a, 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 a brief overview of the, the new capabilities, uh, starting from, from the left, we have new platform capabilities and the major um, integration is around uh, and the, the major support is around ARM. CUDA, we actually announced that we are going to support the ARM platform uh, more than a year ago. Some of you might remember that we did that at, um, at the supercomputing conference uh, all the way back in, uh, in 2019, if I'm not wrong. And uh, we've gone a long way from, uh, from that point, and we fully support the ARM ecosystem in the, in the CUDA toolkit. Uh, the other thing that uh, we integrated uh, in the in the CUDA toolkit is the the GPU direct storage. I'm going to talk about this uh, uh, a little bit later. On the programming model, there's a, a wide range of uh, enhancements around CUDA graphs, allocation uh, types, and allocation uh, APIs, um, and a couple of uh, new language support. And again, I'm going to have a slide on this. On the compiler side, again, th there uh, there's a wide range of uh, new tools that we are introducing. And last but not least, the, the math libraries are still the, the foundation on which most of the applications are built. And we have some, uh, some interesting things there. So let me dive into a couple of these uh, things. I'm going to start again at the very, very low level, uh, and this is the uh, the drive uh, to the CUDA driver level. And you might think that uh, I I'm going way too low, but this is very interesting from a developer perspective, not just from a from a system uh, admin perspective. We're introducing for the first time the the minor version compatibility. So what that means is that you will be able inside of the same uh, CUDA uh, major version to have compatibility and have your application working with the uh, with an older driver. This was never uh, possible before. And when you're building your CUDA application, you always had to make sure that your uh, CUDA version was matching the, the driver version. So for the first time, we are, we are introducing this minor version uh, uh, compatibility which uh, means that both from a, from a user perspective, you'll get a lot more uh, flexibility. So uh, a really, really uh, interesting feature from, uh, from the CUDA, uh, for the CUDA developers. Secondly, uh, again, at the, the very low level, we have some enhancements at the NVCC uh, compiler. The NVCC compiler is the, the compiler which is compiling your, uh, your CUDA code and your host code into a single uh, binary. And especially if you're targeting and you have more complex applications, the, we now have the, the possibility to actually do a parallel build of your application. So that means significant speed up for your code, uh, especially if you're targeting multiple type of GPUs, you would want to, to compile your application to, to target those different uh, microarchitectures. So having a, a, a parallel compilation uh, capability, again, means a lot uh, from a developer perspective and the fact that you can uh, really, really speed up the, uh, the build of, uh, of your application. Um, speaking of uh, compilers, uh, again, one of the, the new announcements is the, uh, the new version of HPC SDK. For those of you who are not familiar with HPC SDK, it's a collection of uh, development tools that uh, we're putting together. One of the, uh, the, uh, the core features or the, the core components in the HPC SDK is the, uh, the NVC compiler and NV Fortran compiler. Uh, if this doesn't sound familiar, it's uh, actually the former PGI compiler that allows you to, uh, to compile uh, both CPU code and GPU code uh, using uh, OpenACC, uh, but also we are offering support for OpenMP. Uh, 
And uh, we had a couple of uh, new integrations, uh, again, at the HPC SDK level with the, uh, with the ARM uh, toolkit. And on top of this, we're providing uh, a wide range of analysis tools. Again, at ISC, uh, we have new version for the uh, our NSIGHT system and NSIGHT compute, which are uh, our profilers uh, targeting both the, the host code and the, the GPU code and some uh, some news around the uh, the CUDA GDB, which is the uh, uh, the CUDA debugger. So again, some really interesting uh, things happening in the, the HPC uh, SDK. Now moving one level up. So I talked about the, the very uh, low level uh, driver and the, the compilers, but most of you, uh, when you're developing an application, you would probably want to, to start with, uh, with pre-built libraries and include this uh, make a simple uh, API call to a library and benefit from the uh, from the acceleration. With CUDA 11, so we announced uh, the the integration of all the uh, uh, the, the CUDA Mac libraries with the new features of A100. Uh, Michael uh, briefly uh, run over some of those uh, features uh, in the presentation earlier. The one of the exciting thing that was introduced in the A100 is the uh, the next generation of tensor cores tensor core actually started in the v100 which is already available in um, in the Gardi system so these libraries are very relevant even if you don't have access to an A100 they're very relevant because you can take benefit automatically from the tensor core uh, from this uh, from this specific core core called the tensor core inside of the um, Nvidia architecture so we have a wide range of math libraries. Uh, there are actually a lot more than this. These are just the uh, the main ones or the ones that are mostly used that I put here. But if you're uh, downloading the CUDA toolkit and if you're a developer, you probably uh, know that there are a lot more libraries than, uh, than this here. So uh, this is uh, a metrics overview of the uh, of the different capabilities. Uh, this is uh, actually updated for the A100. The the TensorFlow in A100 supports multiple uh, uh, data types from the the standard. Uh, uh, FP64, uh, which is one of the innovations in, in Ampere, actually. Uh, previously, we didn't support the double precision in the tensor core, but A100 comes with this capability, all the way to, uh, to the lower precision, which are uh, very important for uh, deep learning. So things like uh, FP16, Int8, uh, even BF16, all these data types allow you to have a, uh, a, um, a faster, uh, processing for your deep learning algorithms. And if you're looking, basically most of the applications current, uh, most of the, sorry, most of the, the libraries currently in the, in the CUDA toolkit uh, support uh, the, the different data types in the tensor core. And just to give you an idea, I'm not gonna go into the details for each one, but I, I'm, I just want to point you to, uh, to Kublas, which is one of the most used uh, libraries. So this provides, uh, APIs and uh, functions for basic linear algebra. Uh, so if you're a developer uh, using uh, standard BLAST, this might sound very familiar. If you're looking at the, uh, the performance, you will see a significant increase depending on the, uh, on the different uh, data types that you're using. So just look at the, uh, at the left hand uh, graph. The, the standard FP32, so single precision performance, without benefiting from the, the tensor core, it's around 20 teraflops. As soon as you're able to, uh, to make use of the tensor cores, uh, be it in the TF32 precision or half precision, that performance is increasing significantly. Even if we're talking about FP64, Again, uh, this is the, the V100 that you currently have in the Gaudi system, uh, and you would get around eight teraflops because of the tensor core that we introduced and the support for FP64 inside of the tensor core in A100. Just by simply using the same library that you, the same Kublas uh, library that you would use on a V100, you would get a, a boost in performance close to, to 20, uh, 20 teraflops. So really, really uh, exciting uh, advancements in the, uh, in the library performance. 
One other library, and again, this is something that um, it's very interesting. And going back to, to ISG, you might have heard uh, uh, in, the, in the top 500 discussion, uh, a new type of benchmark that is being introduced, and that's called HPL AI. And HPL AI is nothing more than uh, a modified version of HPL. Where, you, where the uh, the main solver for the uh, uh, for the operations being done in uh, in HPL are being done in uh, in mixed precision, uh, starting from half precision, and then using something called iterative refinement solvers. What, uh, what this iterative refinement solvers allows you to do is basically starting from a lower precision, you can iterate uh, your solver and get the the same. Um, uh, uh, the same accuracy as if you would run in uh, in full double precision. The advantage is obviously uh, significant. You can see some of the, the numbers uh, here. You can get a very significant speed up. So that actually is, uh, so what is HPL AI is showing it's one hand that even for FP64 application, you don't necessarily have to run them uh, in, uh, in full FP64. So you can take advantage of the, uh, of the lower precision. And secondly, uh, even for traditional applications, you can uh, use this, uh, this solver as part of the, the cool solver to accelerate your application. Um, Another library, uh, again, that is very interesting uh, for developers is uh, QFFT. Uh, this is for uh, fast Fourier transform. I'm not going to go into to all the details, but again, some very significant uh, speed up. If you're into signal processing, basically the, the FFTs is your uh, bread and butter. Uh, and we're really having some exciting um, speed ups for the, for the FFT libraries. And, uh, specifically for the, uh, the QFFT, but we are actually planning to deploy this in other libraries is what we are calling device extension libraries. So that allows, uh, and we started to implement this with QFFT uh, under the name QFFT DX. And this allows you to basically uh, fusion multiple kernels and keep the data on, uh, on the GPU. As you know, when you're programming an accelerator, the most of the penalty comes from the fact that you have to go back and forth between the CPU and the GPU. So being able to keep the data in between computations on the GPU, that brings significant speed up on your overall uh, application. So uh, the, the QFFT is available uh, as part of the, the math library early access program. So uh, I put the, the website there. You can uh, go to and uh, you can go to the website and check the library. Uh, you only have to uh, register as a CUDA developer that's uh, free of charge. And I highly encourage you, if you are a, a CUDA developer, to, to get registered as a developer because you will get a, a lot of um, uh, goodies like access to uh, to early early access program. You you get invitation to to technical sessions uh, and a lot of other uh, things. So as I said, device extension libraries will be extended to to other libraries. Uh, we're going to uh, work on uh, QSolver DX and QBlast DX, which will provide similar uh, capabilities. One other thing that. Uh, uh, we are introducing with the Ampere architecture, and again, uh, Michael very briefly mentioned, is uh, the capability of working uh, with uh, sparse matrices. This is uh, a, a, a game-changing innovation, especially in the, in the space of uh, deep learning, but this can have uh, utilization in traditional applications. So up to recently, the only way to, to tap into this uh, capability is, was to, to go to the, uh, to the low level uh, CUDA programming language. But with the, with the latest release of the, the CUDA library, we are actually bringing the, uh, the sparsity uh, capability inside of the library. So if you're using GooSparse LT, you can uh, automatically get access to, to the sparsity feature in the uh, A100. Because we're, uh, uh, this is an HPC talk, um, we cannot uh, ignore the fact that uh, you want to, to run this on a supercomputer. 
most of the, the things that I mentioned previously were uh, speed ups that you're getting out of a single GPU. But obviously, uh, one single GPU, uh, although we are increasing the, uh, the amount of memory uh, more and more, we've uh, heard, we've just announced the, the 80 gig PCIe version of A100. Sometimes the, uh, the data cannot, still cannot fit inside of a single GPU. So you need support for multiple GPU either uh, multiple GPUs inside of a node and multiple uh, GPUs across multiple nodes. So for that reason, we are uh, having uh, a, an intense effort to, to bring multi-GPU support to, to the libraries. And this means basically having built-in support in the, in the libraries, because obviously you can do your own uh, the composition of your of the model using different techniques like OpenMP, MPI. But what we wanted to do is to bring uh, really multi GPU support in uh, directly inside of the uh, the libraries API. So we started again with QFFT, and this is part of the, the latest CUDA release. And we are doing simi uh, a similar thing with the uh, with the Q solver, uh, providing multi GPU uh, LU solvers. All of these are available uh, part of the, the early access program. So if you're interested in, um, in having a, a sneak peek on, the, uh, on these capabilities, I highly encourage you to, uh, to take a look at the, uh, the, the Math Library's early access program. Now I'm gonna switch the, the register a little bit. And for those of you who are uh, Python fans, so CUDA Python uh, is a preview release. Uh, which is providing Python uh, and Cyton wrappers for the for the CUDA drivers. You might know that uh, th there are different implementations uh, like Numba and others were providing this in the past, but it, each each of them had their own um, interface. What we're being, what we're bringing with uh, with CUDA Python is we are providing a uniform API and bindings for inclusion in existing tools and uh, and libraries. Again, this is a, an exciting um, a feature and it's been requested for uh, quite some time. This will be available on, uh, on, uh, uh, on GitHub uh, uh, quite soon. We, are, we, uh, we just announced this at, uh, at GTC and you will be able to, to, uh, to, to see the, the whole interface uh, source code and uh, integrate it into your code. And once again, because uh, we are talking about HPC, uh, we want to, to run Python at scale. And you might be familiar with this, uh, uh, with this project called uh, Legate. It's coming from one of the DOE labs. And this allows you to actually run Python across multiple uh, nodes. So what we are announcing here, and again, this, uh, this is uh, very fresh from, uh, from the ISC, we will be introducing uh, two integrations with uh, Legate, one called Legate NumPy and the other one Legate Pandas. This will aim to transparently scale uh, any existing NumPy or Pandas workloads. Again, this will be available uh, uh, freely on, uh, on GitHub and uh, uh, we really hope to, to see some, uh, some excitement in the, in the Python community uh, because you'll be able to, to seamlessly uh, scale your Python applications uh, across multiple nodes. Uh, staying in the in the library uh, registry, but uh, in the in the library space, but switching the the registry a little bit. Uh, again, this is something that we announced at GTC. Nvidia is entering the uh, the space of uh, quantum computing. And this might seem a little bit odd. Nvidia is not producing any any quantum computers, at least not for now, uh, and we are not uh, in that uh, in that space. But quantum computing has been around for quite some time, and it's uh, and it's seeing a lot of uh, traction. But there's still a, a long way to to go until we'll actually have a functional uh, quantum uh, computing uh, quantum computer. In the meantime, there's a lot of work that has to be done to simulate a quantum, uh, quantum computer. So we're introducing a, a new library uh, called QQuantum. Uh, at the beginning, there will be two types of simulations. There will be a state vector simulation and the tensor network uh, simulation. 
Uh, this is still in very early uh, days. We are defining what should be included in this library. And actually, we are going to have a, uh, a session with your colleagues from Posi uh, this Friday. So if you're interested to, to hear more uh, about uh, Quantum Library, I highly encourage you to, to join that, uh, that session. So uh, you should be able to find it on the Posi website. Now, uh, switching uh, again uh, gears a little bit and moving to the, the AI platform, I talked about the, uh, the HPC uh, innovation. So switching to, to the AI platform, we are providing capabilities for all the, the different pillars from the, the training side, which is the main uh, uh, workhorse for the GPUs. Uh, and the, the simple reason is because that's the computational intensive part. So we are providing acceleration for all the, all the deep learning frameworks. And those deep learning frameworks are mo are entirely based on things that I presented previously, from the the CUDA X libraries to the uh, to the CUDA programming language. Uh, we are allocating a, a special focus to to, uh, to inference, and sometimes uh, this is uh, neglected, uh, both from the developer side, but also from the uh, from the admin side. So there are a couple of tools uh, that are allowing to to run high performance uh, inference. And again, uh, on this side, uh, I'm going to have a talk at the the CSRO. Uh, conference, the, the C3, C3DIS conference uh, next week uh, when I'm going to present into a lot more details, uh, specifically this part, how you can run high performance inferencing. So uh, if you're interested in this uh, portion, I highly encourage you to, to join that session. And last but not least, uh, we are investing in application frameworks. We know that uh, especially in the AI space, uh, you don't need to be familiar with the, the CUDA programming language with the different libraries. You want to have a, a, a workflow and you want to have an environment that is tailored for your specific applications. And we developed SDKs for healthcare, we developed SDKs for autonomous vehicles, we, uh, we developed SDKs for conversational AI. So I'm going to mention just a couple of these and the, the innovation that we had in the uh, in the space for uh, each of these. Before moving forward, I wanted to say that uh, all these uh, goodies are uh, available for free and they're part of the NVIDIA GPU uh, cloud or NGC catalog. Uh, despite the name, this is a collection of uh, containers, pre-trained models, uh, industry frameworks, Helm charts for deployment, so if you're interested in any of the, the things that uh, I'll be talking in the, the next uh, couple of slides, I highly, highly encourage you to, to go to NGC and, uh, and check, them, uh, check them out. Um, one of the, uh, the things that uh, we introduced uh, a while ago uh, was uh, TLT, Transfer Learning Toolkit. And the main reason for, uh, for having such libraries is that Training a deep neural uh, network model, especially uh, complicated ones like NLP models or others, takes really a long time to, to do it. So most of uh, most of the time, <clears throat> when you want to uh, to quickly have a model tailored for your application, you can actually train the uh, you, you can actually take a pre-trained model and retrain it using your own uh, data set. And that will provide you a, a model that is tailored for your specific use case in a fraction of the time that it would take to actually train the whole model from scratch. So for TLT, uh, we, are, uh, announced, uh, we have announced at GTC a developer preview for version 3.0. And the main feature that we're introducing, besides the, the support for the, uh, all the, the goodies in the Ampere architecture, is the support to train conversational AI models. Uh, previously, the TLT was only for uh, computer vision uh, models. So now we are bringing uh, conversational AI models. We are bringing full support for multi-GPU and multi-node. Again, you, uh, when you're training these complex models, you probably want to, to do this at scale. And last but not least, we're bringing uh, new model architectures and capabilities inside of, um, of TLT. Now, you have 
train your model, whether from scratch or using TLT, and you want to deploy it, which is the next step. Deploy, again, deploying a model, uh, or once you have a model that is being trained, uh, deploying it, it's, again, not an easy task. You, have, you want to, to optimize the, the model before doing the deployment and to, to meet uh, certain criteria. And those criteria are different from the, the ones that you have uh, when you're doing your training. So, for example, when you're doing the, uh, the inference portion, latency becomes a, a very uh, critical um, factor. In order to, once again, to help the developers, we've introduced uh, quite a number of years ago, uh, TensorRT uh, framework. And as you can see, we've just announced version eight, which is a major uh, release. And TensorRT allows you to, uh, to basically optimize the, the runtime, optimize the model and the, the runtime to execute the inference for, uh, for your model. Without, again, going into all the details, you have the, the link here to, to check out the TensorRT. We are bringing quite some uh, interesting features like uh, quantization aware training, where you can actually experience the, uh, the accuracy of FP32, what you normally use in your uh, trainings, but using int eight precision. So obviously quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of, uh, of speed up. So the next step, you've trained and you've optimized the model. Now you want to, to deploy the model. Again, we're providing uh, capabilities to, to deploy the, uh, your model. And we are providing um, a new SDK called Triton Inference Server. And the interesting thing about Triton Inference Server, beside the fact that it, it simplifies the, the whole deployment of AI models at scale and in production, is that it doesn't only support GPUs, as you might expect, but it also supports CPU. So you can stay inside of the, uh, uh, the same uh, familiar framework and you can deploy your inference both on the CPU and on the GPU. Well, again, we, uh, at GTC, we announced the version 2.9 with some uh, interesting features and I highly encourage you to, to take a look at, uh, at those. Putting everything uh, together, we have a new framework that will provide a, uh, an easy to, to build GUI interface to actually tap into some of the, the things that I mentioned previously. And this is called TAO. Uh, it's basically an acronym. It comes from Train, Adapt, and Optimize. And it's bringing together uh, tools that uh, were mentioned in the previous slides in, in an easy to weigh uh, interface. You're basically having building blocks to build your application. So you start from uh, getting models from NGC. Uh, you do the training through TLT. Uh, you can adapt the models and then have the, uh, have the inferencing. So it's an easy way to, to tap in all the, the tools that I mentioned, uh, mentioned previously. On the SDK and industry SDK, I only want to, uh, uh, to stop on, uh, on two SDKs which, are, uh, uh, which we introduced at uh, GTC. Uh, and provide some, uh, some interesting capabilities. The first one is Jarvis. Uh, Jarvis is an uh, application framework for enterprises or developers who are building uh, multimodal conversational AI services. And what we are announcing with, uh, with Jarvis is that you, basically you can build accurate applications for, um, uh, for NLP. So anything that goes around NLP and it's just, it, it's not just uh, NLP, but uh, ASR, TTS, all these are included inside of the, uh, of the Jarvis uh, framework. At the end, the, the next one is uh, NVIDIA Merlin. Uh, NVIDIA Merlin, again, it's, a, um, it's an SDK and the framework for recommender system. This is, uh, again, not an easy fit to, uh, to build. And you are interacting with recommender systems every day, but you might not know about it. So when you're watching a, a movie on Netflix and it's recommending the, the next uh, movies to, to binge on, or when you're buying something on, uh, on Amazon and you get uh, 10 more products recommended to you, all those, is, uh, all those are actually uh, recommended systems that are doing the, the job. 
So building a recommender system, it's uh, again, it's not an uh, easy task. So we put together uh, the NVIDIA Merlin uh, application framework to, to, uh, to do um, exactly this. So I highly encourage if you're doing any, any work or research on, uh, on recommender system, the systems to, to take a look at the, uh, the NVIDIA uh, Merlin. On the cybersecurity, uh, again, switching the, the register a little bit, uh, we are introducing the, uh, the Morpheus AI cyber security framework. This uh, framework is targeting specifically uh, applications and developers working in the, in the cyberspace. Uh, the, uh, the Morpheus AI framework allows you to actually have a uh, real-time analysis of the, uh, the, the data traffic going through, through the network and take different actions on that. It's the, one of the first analyzers that is able to, to do this in, uh, in real time. It, integrated, it integrates multiple uh, components and libraries from uh, what I presented earlier. But again, this package is specifically uh, built and tailored for uh, cybersecurity, and it goes hand in hand with the Bluefield DPU, the smart NICs that again, uh, Michael mentioned earlier. So having a smart NIC inside of your uh, a system will highly uh, accelerate the, uh, uh, the capabilities of the, the Murphyus uh, framework. So uh, I'm running out of time. So just two, two more things that I wanted to, to share with you. Uh, um, NVIDIA Omniverse, it's again something that we announced uh, a little bit over a year ago. And Omniverse is basically a cloud native multi GPU platform for virtual collaboration. And although this is mostly for, uh, uh, for artists and game developers or those working in the uh, architecture industry or uh, similarly, at ISC, we, uh, so yesterday, we had an announcement that we are integrating PowerView Omniverse Connector. So those of you in the uh, in HPC visualization might be familiar with, uh, with PowerView. It's a, uh, a tool for uh, HPC visualization, and we are integrating the, the PowerView tool with Omniverse. That means that you can actually import assets from uh, various sources and various uh, simulations and work collaboratively inside Omniverse to do a uh, very interesting uh, in situ visualization. Uh, this is a screenshot actually of a, of a demo that we're showing at ISC. So again, I highly encourage you to, to take a look at the, the demo uh, and some of the some other information that I presented earlier are available on the nvidia.com slash ISC webpage. So uh, with that, uh, that brings me to the end of my presentation.